great speaker here today. He's been here before, but it's been a while. So let me introduce a man named Michael Wilkos. As a teenager, what did you do over the summer just for fun? Did you draw up a development plan for the city of Columbus that had a high density walkable and connected to, by transit? If I said that right, did anybody do that as a child? Okay. Um, can you recall the year, month, date, and time of the grand opening of City Center Mall? Anybody want to guess? Not you. 1988. Mm. Uh, one year off, 89. according to my records. Uh, it was August 18th, well, when was it? August 18th, 1988, 10 a.m. 88 or 89? 88. Oh, I said 89. No, I have an 89 in my notes, my bad. Oh, 89. My bad. Hey. Uh, <laughs> no, wait, it is 89. It is 89. It is 89. Okay. What's the price? Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, finally, to dispel any doubt, did you ever run an ad in your high school newspaper declaring, discover Columbus and capture the spirit? Would you ever think of doing such a thing? Probably not, but Michael did. He loves Columbus. Um, you'll have to tell him about the t-shirt that you found, too. That was kind of a cool story. Michael is uh, Senior Vice President of Community Impact at our United Way. His team develops effective strategies to improve our community and invest in programs provided by our funded partners to implement these strategies. Prior to joining United Way, Michael was the Director of Community Outreach at the Columbus Foundation. During his tenure there, he managed and led more than $9 million in competitive grant making to support holistic community revitalization in Wineland Park, an effort to stabilize and revitalize a mixed community, a mixed uh, income community near OSU. Michael has held positions with the Dancer Company, Capital South Community Urban Redevelopment Corporation, and the City of Columbus. He has a bachelor's degree in geography and a master's degree in city and regional planning, both from The Ohio State University. Please help me welcome Michael Wilkos to Columbus Rotary. Great. Good afternoon. I'm going to rotate this just a little bit so I can see the screen. Uh, I should also say that my real knowledge of the city came in those years that I got to work for George Arnold. Uh, and so thank you for all of the direction that you gave our city during those years. And uh, I was working in the Linden community, and I live just one mile outside of Linden, just in the Wineland Park neighborhood. So hopefully you'll like my slide deck, because I have been working on it for about 40 years. <laughs> okay, so I work at United Way, and we fund 92 nonprofits in Franklin County, and we're entirely focused on basic needs and student success. However, all of those nonprofits are reacting to and responding to the growth of the city and the demographic changes of our community. And often they feel that what's happening in their microgeography is unique to just that neighborhood. So I've put together this presentation as a framing of the city that we now share. I actually have two parts to this. You're going to get part one. And if you like part one, maybe you'll have me come back and do part two, which is a little bit more of a deep dive into the history of how our city developed and why it looks the way it does. So as one quick example, because where we're located, North 4th Street, which is right here, North 4th, North 5th, and North 6th Street were the only three streets this side of downtown, this side of 71, that never had restrictive covenants that prevented people of color from owning property on just those three streets on the north side of Columbus. One of the reasons why this portion running up North 4th Street into Wyland Park is mixed race and mixed income is because of that history. And how many of you have gone to Bud Dairy, which is right up the street here? Uh, quick story, Bud Dairy uh, went out of business because they advertised a new milk bank milk-based soft drink in a KKK flyer when the Ku Klux Klan had a convention at the Ohio Fairgrounds. And the faith community in Italian Village in Wineland Park started to tell all of their members to no longer go to Bud Dairy. And by the time they went on the defense, it was too late. And Bud Dairy went out of business, and it was one of the first examples in America of a faith-based organizing around racial justice that put Bud Dairy under. So that and many more is part two. All right, so let's go to part one. 
as I go through this slide deck, I love this quote. Our dilemma is that we hate change and we love it at the same time, but what we really want is for things to remain the same and get better. So as I walk through these slides, I want you to think about like, is Columbus getting better and who is it getting better, better for? And could it be getting better for me and not be getting better for the neighbor who lives next door to me, okay? Big issue about our community, we've added 250,000 people in the last 11 years and the rest of the state of Ohio outside of Columbus has lost 5,500 people. What's happening in greater Columbus is a very different situation than the rest of the state. If you look at the growth of the region, <clears throat> we have been increasing just slightly in our growth rate. For those of us that live and work in Franklin County, it feels like Columbus is growing so much more quickly, and there's a reason for that, because if you look at this slide, go to the second from the right slide that says 43%, because between 2000 and 2010, 43 percent of metro growth, the 10 county metro, happened in Franklin County. This decade it was 70 percent of all growth in the 10 county region happened in Franklin. <laughs> as the growth of the metropolitan region dramatically shifted and that growth started to come inward. I believe it came inward because of the diversity and typology of the housing stock in Franklin County offers much more diversity of housing. And when you see the demographics of how we're growing, they need a more diverse housing stock. And Delaware and looking in Fairfield counties is a lot of larger single family homes on large lots. And that's just not what we need. So now Columbus, 906,000 people. We just had the highest percentage growth within the city limits in 70 years. And in a numeric lens, it was the largest numeric increase ever recorded in Columbus history for population growth. We are experiencing something very special right now. When you compare Columbus, we actually grew faster than Houston and Nashville and Dallas and Phoenix, which is shocking that a city in the Midwest could best so many Sunbelt and West Coast cities. These metros might be growing faster than our metro, but the core city of Dallas and Houston and Phoenix is not growing faster than the city of Columbus. Now, for those of you that have been around a long time, how many of you were born and grew up here in Central Ohio? Raise your hands. OK. How many somewhere else in the state of Ohio? Outside Ohio, but in the US. Ooh, look at that. And you're all in together. That's interesting. <laughs> OK. So Columbus, right, was the very first city ever created by an act of the state legislature to be a state capital. And Columbus did what? It grew through this tool of annexation. So now we are a city that is 220 square miles. It's in 11 of the 16 school districts in the county, and the city of Columbus is in three counties. And we've really had this unwritten rule that Columbus has never really let any two of its suburbs touch, right? So we have these tentacles, right? We have that tentacle that runs between Dublin and Hilliard. We got that tentacle that came down. It collected Rickenbacker. You probably made that happen, George. Thank you for that, all those jobs. Thank you for the tax income. Um, and then there's, if you see this, I'm going to walk over. That little line right there. The city of Columbus is about 50 feet wide as it wedged itself between Gahanna and New Albany. We have preserved the growth corridors that have kept the city of Columbus with a AAA bond rating. All that annexation has come to a close where we're no longer annexing land. The city only grew 1.5% in land area, but somehow we had to squeeze 119,000 more people into our existing city. And that changed everybody's neighborhood. And we're gonna unpack in what ways, okay? Now Columbus is also going vertical. We all just saw that the project on the far right just got its tax credit, so construction is beginning on the North Market Tower. The other two are mainly residential projects for downtown. We see projects like this happening in all of the neighborhoods that surround downtown. And these projects are changing the conversation around scale and massing and density and parking and cultural identity as those neighborhoods are absorbing more people. And the suburbs are also changing dramatically, where suburban communities are building greater density and integrating uses and much larger scale projects. And the one on the top right is Dublin's Bridge Park, which I love because Dublin is saying we have all these larger homes built really in the 80s and 90s. And as people are becoming empty nesters, they want to stay in Dublin. But Dublin really doesn't have the housing that they're looking for. And all of this stuff that you see 
is really driven by two very simple things, lifestyle and convenience. If you are young and single, it's all about lifestyle. So what are you looking for? Density, walkability, and transit. If you're an empty nester, you're looking for convenience. You don't want that large home. You don't want that large lot. Both of those bookends, lifestyle and convenience, are changing the urban form right in front of our eyes. Now, if you look at the growth of our city, let's start at the very bottom of the slide and you see what happened in the United States. Growth in America slowed from 9.7 to 7.4 percent. It was the slowest growth in America since the 1930s. When growth in America started to slow, it started to pick up here, where growth in Columbus was up 50 percent and growth in Franklin County also increased as it slowed in the rest of the country. If you look at the metropolitan region, every single central Ohio community posted growth. What you see in blue are those places that are growing faster than the county average of 14%. And in the orange are those that are growing but not as fast as the county average. Whitehall, which has been losing people for 50 years, now grew by 11% as the demographic shifts in Whitehall have created a very different Whitehall than it was 10 years ago. We also have the most equitable distribution of growth we've seen in decades. We have high growth suburbs on the north end, which is how we've wanted to grow for decades. We also have high growth suburbs on the south end, and we have high growth suburbs like Grandview Heights, which are what's called an inner ring suburb, where they don't really have any new land, but they're repurposing land like Grandview Yard, which was all warehouses, which is now, now going vertical. Put this into perspective, there's going to be 44 more people living in this county at the end of the day than when you woke up this morning. And uh, I know, think about that, right? And on an annual basis, we add 16,000 people every year to Franklin County, which means we have to build in an entire Worthington or an entire Bexley every 12 months to accommodate our growth. The problem is we've only been adding housing for 8,000 of that 16,000 person growth, and that's the underpinnings of why the housing market's behaving the way it is, and we'll get into that in a second. So here we are. The county grew by 14%. There was only two parts of Franklin County that lost people during this last decade. The one was from COSI all the way out to Hollywood Casino. Every neighborhood straddling Sullivan Avenue and West Broad Street lost housing units and lost people as the west side has what? It continues to struggle under social ills, right? It is not a desirable neighborhood and it is losing people. The other part of Franklin County that lost people, which I was shocked on the surface, but it makes sense, everything from Nationwide Children's Hospital running south down Parsons, Miller, Kelton, Whittier, that whole zone lost people not because that neighborhood is struggling, but because that neighborhood is on a rapid rise as all of those neighborhoods are responding to massive job growth at Nationwide Children's Hospital. What's happening there are renter families with school-aged children are being replaced by homeowners who are often a single working professional, sometimes a two-person professional, but almost never then with kids. So you're getting a house that once had five people, that house might have one person, housing prices are doubling and tripling, but the population headcount is going down. It used to be we could look at these maps as a nonprofit investor and say, oh, if a neighborhood's losing people, that must mean that the neighborhood is not attractive, right? And if a neighborhood's growing, that must mean people are moving there. Those relationships have shifted because the housing market has shifted underneath people. We now have neighborhoods that are losing people as they're getting better, and we have neighborhoods that are growing as they're getting weaker and poorer. And this is a new relationship that we have to more fully understand. And we're going to pick that apart. Largest numeric increase in Columbus history. All of that growth was due to people of color. Largest numeric increase ever recorded in Columbus history. It was the first decade the white population of Columbus actually fell in real numbers. We added 119,000 people. Someone is plotting in the back of the room based on that demographic shift, right? We're a very different place, OK? We added 119,000 people, we added 121,000 non-white, and lost 2,000 white residents. The same is true for Franklin County. Franklin County added 160,000 people. 
It added 163,000 non-white, and it lost 3,000 white residents as the white population continues to pick up and move to Delaware, looking in Fairfield counties, right? Here's the chart. You can scan those numbers. I won't walk you through it. Now, the white population barely dropped down 0.4%. That is statistically not significant. It is significant in that every other racial group dramatically increased, right? Not really driven by a growth in the black population, but Asian, other, two or more, and Hispanic. Some of this is also because many of us who used to identify as white alone or black alone now recognize that our family lineage is a little bit more interesting than what we've been picking on a census form, and a lot of people just don't like these categories. So some people are shifting to two or more races or some other race. That's part of this, but the bigger story is we're dramatically changing. Everywhere in green got more diverse in the last decade. Our diversity index went from 50 to 60. You'll see in a second what that means. Increase in diversity was not just a Columbus thing, right? It wasn't an inner ring suburb thing. It wasn't a downtown thing. It was also a beltway thing, and it was an inner ring suburb thing. Everybody got more diverse. Despite that, here is how we currently look. In red are all of those places that are homogeneous. Ignore the red in the bottom left of that map because that's rural Franklin County, south of Grove City. It's entirely farms. We would expect that to not be a diverse place. So what are the most homogeneous places in 2020? They are Bexley, German Village, Grandview, Arlington, Clintonville, and Worthington. It is important that we acknowledge homogeneity is not just a suburban thing. It can also be within the city limits of Columbus, German Village, and Clintonville. But that our most homogeneous places, five of the six of them, were built under redlining and restrictive covenants that prohibited people of color from living there when they were built. And 100 years later, the racial demographics really haven't budged. Right. Yet, when you look at Dublin in the top left or New Albany in the top right, Dublin and New Albany may be homogeneous based on what's in your wallet. New Albany and Dublin are not homogeneous through the lens of race, culture, and language. Because New Albany and Dublin have been built entirely since civil rights and fair housing laws went into place. Zoning and land use has dictated that Dublin and New Albany are wealthy but they are not homogeneous racially. New Albany High School has an official NAACP chapter as 10% of New Albany High School identifies as black. You'll see in a minute why that's true. <coughs> Highest growth places, three of them are out on the urban periphery. Three of them are down near the core of the city. This has shifted where the highest growth communities might be out on the edge, where farms become development, and high growth communities can be existing neighborhoods that have dramatically shifted. Some of that is what's happening in our downtown, right? Up 91%. Every downtown in America saw this experience. But ours was a little broader. In this shaded area, Grandview Yard, Harrison West, Italian Village, Wineland Park, King Lincoln, Marion Village, all of those neighborhoods around downtown were caught up in that surge where our existing neighborhoods around downtown saw a 44% increase. Why is that important? Because all of those neighborhoods are already served by roads and sewer lines and infrastructure, and the city of Columbus does not have to lay new infrastructure to accommodate a 44% population growth. That's very different than when you're building development out on the urban periphery, it's say the Hayden Run corridor, where the city has to extend infrastructure, right? So very different environment for our community. Now let's go into neighborhoods. Linden is a growing neighborhood where Linden jumped 7% in population. I was very surprised by this. I was surprised to see that the growth in Linden was across North and South Linden, and 11 of the 12 census tracts in Linden are growing. And I thought, finally, right? That plan that George Arnold made me implement in the 90s, right? <laughs> it's finally paying off, George. It took 25 years, but I got it. And then as I started to peel the layers of the onion off, I realized that the growth in Linden was not really because something good was happening in Linden, but something far more troubling is manifesting itself in Linden and a couple other communities. And that is that while the population's up 7%, that is a very respectable growth, there's 2,600 more people living in Linden than 10 years ago. 
but there's 4% less housing units in Linden than 10 years ago. This is new, right? You don't typically see neighborhoods at 2,600 people as the number of houses in the neighborhood falls by 652. Thank you for the facial, you're very animated. Let's play poker. Because I can finally win that game. All right. So Linden's losing housing units and adding people, so how are you growing? For decades, the number of people living in the typical American home has been getting fewer and fewer and fewer as what? Our homes have been getting bigger and bigger as there's less and less of us per family. That trend stopped and reversed itself this decade because we're growing so fast and we've been underbuilding housing so much for a decade that places like Linden went from 2.2 people per unit to 2.6 people per unit. So the number of people living per structure is on the rise for the first time in over half a century. In Linden, there are 1,083 less vacant structures than 10 years ago. This is a very good thing because we started to remove what the blight of vacant and abandoned properties that have been pulling that neighborhood down for some time. And the city of Columbus has been focused on that where the city took down 403 abandoned boarded up houses in Linden that were beyond the point of economic salvation. But the number of vacant structures fell by 1,100. So what happened to the other 700 vacant structures? They came back online, right? That's a good thing. But they didn't come back online because people who live in Linden purchased a vacant house and renovated it. They came back online because real estate investors look at the demographics. They see Columbus is growing. Columbus is not building enough housing. So how are we going to accommodate people? We have to bring this vacant housing back online. And that was what happened all across the city, which was really not detected until the census came out with their numbers. In Linden, Right? The white population fell for Columbus. The white population fell for Franklin County. It ticked up in Linden. That's interesting because now for the first time, white housing consumers are jumping Interstate 71 and they're starting to gobble up properties around Oakland Park Nursery and in North Linden as the price of housing in Old North Columbus and Clintonville has gotten so high, people are jumping that Berlin Wall, which was not a wall, but it was a highway, and Interstate 71, and by the way, the railroad track that runs along Interstate 71, that has been the race demarcation line for this town for a century, and it has held for a century until now, when those white consumers are jumping at East North Broadway and Oakland Park into North Linden. Okay. Now let's go to Northland, which is more fascinating. Is this interesting so far? Okay because I've got like three hours of content. <laughs> Every single census tract in Northland is growing. Now think about it. Get off the highway at Morse Road at 71 and drive down Morse Road all the way to Easton. Get off 71 at 161 and drive all the way down 161. How much housing construction have you seen in the last decade? Nothing. And yet, Northland grew faster than Columbus and faster than Franklin County. In fact, Northland added the entire city of Bexley in the last decade and didn't add any housing for those people. Okay, let's unpack the fact that Giant Eagle closes at 161 and 71. Meyer closes at 161 and Cleveland Avenue and Kroger closes at Northern Lights. How do three different chain grocery stores close locations when the neighborhood adds 14,000 more consumers? Makes no sense. But it does when you begin to unpack it because Kroger and Giant Eagle and Meyer can't do what? They cannot shift a manager's ability to stock those shelves that matches the rapidly changing demographics of their consumers. And as they closed, there's an explosion of grocery stores and merchants all along 161 and Morse Road that do what? Sell more culturally appropriate foods for the people who live there. So you see Saraga, right, that opened on Morse Road in the old Sun TV location, right? and the Saraga actually took over the closed Kroger at Northern Lights. That big box store stayed vacant for about 13 months. Okay. So yet, the total number of housing units in Northland is only up 484 more units, but 14,000 more people living there. How does that happen? Because Northland had the largest reduction in vacant housing anywhere in Franklin County. 48% of all the vacant houses in Northland 
came back online. And there's a picture that I grabbed off Google Street View in 2011, where an entire apartment complex on Northtown Boulevard near Tamarack Circle was just taken offline. Housing market collapses in seven and eight. By the time the 2010 census is done, it's measuring a very weak housing market, and Northland is a weak neighborhood in a weak housing time, so developers just walked away from stuff. Ten years later, that apartment complex is back. How is it back? Well, you just had to put in new carpet, paint the walls. It's an easy fix. Right? So the number of occupied units is up by 2,600, and the number of people per unit in Northland is also rising, just like it's rising in Linden. Why is Northland and Linden behaving in the way they are? This is my map of Columbus right now with my hands. Polaris, Easton, John Glenn, downtown OSU. Northland and Linden are entirely surrounded by every major job center in the metro, and every one of those job centers added jobs and has a diversity of jobs within them. Eastland, Hamilton Road, Kimberly Parkway, the closing of Eastland Mall, the city just kind of falls apart that direction, right? There's no employment bookends, right? Why did the short north and Victorian village come back? Billy Ireland predicted that in the 1920s in one of his cartoons in the Dispatch about what was going to happen there, because the short north and Victorian village are between two massive bookends, downtown and Ohio State. Why is the Near East Side coming back? It's between two bookends, downtown and Bexley. Northland and Linden have a whole bunch of bookends. The West Side, nothing, because Hollywood Casino didn't really work out. Okay? They never do. They never do. And we knew that, and we said that. And I will argue the design of Hollywood Casino was a complete urban design failure because they made it as an isolated thing set back from the street so it has no residual impact even if it could generate one. We screwed it up with bad design, okay? Same thing's happening on the east side of the city. The city is falling apart, to be blunt, on Bryce Road and Gender Road even before it's finished. That's policy. Here's what happened to Northland. The white population only fell by 2%, but look at what happened with other demographic groups. Northland now has a massive Asian community that did not exist 10 years ago, and it is mostly Nepali Bhutanese, right? An Asian community that didn't exist really much 10 years ago. All right, if you think of Northland, what happened with that commercial revitalization? Nor Morse Road was the number one zip code in the state of Ohio for retail sales in the 1997 uh, economic census. Ten years later, Morse Road was a fraction of its former retail might. As those chain stores, Lazarus, Sears, JCPenney, TJ Maxx, as those chain stores did and always do, they always pick up and move and they follow the growth of new households on the urban periphery. And if you're Hamilton Road and West Broad Street and you're not booming with a new portion of growth, you have millions of square feet of vacant commercial real estate, which is what you have on West Broad and what you have on Hamilton Road. And on Morse Road, you have a 1% retail vacancy, right? Morse Road is more local and more entrepreneurial than what the Short North is today and probably what the Short North was in the 80s and 90s. And all of that is because Morse Road is responding to a global diaspora, which is playing out around the planet. And when new Americans come to Ohio, Franklin County is the number one choice, and Morse Road is the number one choice within that number one place. And why would new Americans go to Morse Road and not Hamilton Road? Because, if you're paying attention, Morse Road is surrounded by every major job center, and they get that. No one showed them the map of employment destinations, but they get it. All right. Near East Side is not growing nearly as quickly as what people think, because for most of the last decade, the Near East Side was losing people. The Near East Side only added 550 people, okay? Barely any growth, but what happened on the Near East Side was it ejected 1,600 seniors and it ejected 1,100 children. What happens in a neighborhood when a neighborhood, which is an organic place that really thrives when people are diverse by age, by religion, by race, when neighborhoods start ejecting seniors and children, generally seniors and children are not income earners, they're not in the workforce, and when a housing market in a neighborhood becomes so rapidly escalating, the neighborhood now says, if you're not a current income earner where you can contribute to housing costs, you no longer have value to the neighborhood, and we're going to start ejecting you, right? So that's what's happening all over the Near East Side. 
And where's the balloon? 20 to 50 year olds. And they tend to be white. Because no other neighborhood experienced a racial flip flop than this neighborhood. From 19 to 37%, the black population is dropping. Also on the Near East side, it was third in the reduction of vacant and abandoned housing. There's 1,200 less vacant homes in that neighborhood than 10 years ago as housing consumers are going anywhere they can to find housing. And here's how it manifests itself. If you can't read my numbers, that little bungalow in the top right with the yellow door, that house went from $154,000 to $270,000 in 90 days. These are examples of properties that were not well maintained where real estate investment companies are purchasing the home, renovating them with new kitchens and baths, staging them with restoration hardware stuff, and they're doubling or tripling the price of the home and people are snatching them up. Why? Because Columbus is still running one third cheaper than the US average and as we import housing consumers from other markets, they're showing up with a lot of cash on hand and a $270,000 renovated house near your job at Nationwide Children's Hospital, you don't bat an eye because you're buying it with cash. The other thing that's happening is um, there's all kinds of flipping now going on in our urban neighborhoods. And I will suggest to you, if you invite me back again, you'll see how what's happening today is a whole new version of redlining. And I believe we will judge what's happening right now on this very day with the same harshness in 20 and 30 years that we now look back on redlining. A whole new victimization is right before our eyes. All right. All right, let's go back to the county. In green is where the black population is growing. In red is where the black population fell. I'm going to oversimplify it, but black residents are leaving the 1950 boundaries of Columbus. They're leaving the original Columbus School District boundaries, and black households are suburbanizing, both in Columbus and the suburbs. Essentially, as black housing consumers move and stay local, the, the choice is Westerville, Gahanna, New Albany, Reynoldsburg, and Pickerington. And as black residents move up the economic mobility ladder, they're doing what? They're staying on the right side of that racial demarcation line that is Interstate 71, because those black housing consumers are not picking Grandview and Arlington and Dublin and Powell. Largest drop in the black population was Franklinton, where the black population fell on this example, 61%. The decade started with Riverside Bradley by CMHA. It ended the decade with River and Rich, a Casto community. If the black population falls in your neighborhood 61%, you're gonna notice, right? Here is where the black population is going. This is Upper Albany West, built by MI Homes. This is the epicenter of the great black migration that is suburbanizing but staying within the city of Columbus. Three census tracts have the largest growth in black residents. They're all connected to each other, 72.1409 and 15, and they all touch the city of New Albany. That is not gentrification. That's not displacement. This is a black middle class movement of choice, and they're picking the same kinds of neighborhoods all of us want, safe neighborhoods, good schools, services. Yeah, I'm going to pick it up. Where's the white population dropping? Northland, Eastland, and Westland have the largest drop in the white population. You see that. Oh, and by the way, while the white population only fell by 0.4%, we started last decade 69% white. We ended the decade just over 60% white. If the same demographic change continues this decade, there will not be a racial majority left in Franklin County by the end of this decade. If we do not have strong DE&I, diversity, equity, inclusion platforms, where we live, where we work, where we worship, it's not where we're headed, we're there, right? And if you are a company, and you're a large company, and you have not created a culturally competent environment where non-whites are interested in working, you're gonna be in big trouble when half of all the people in our community are non-white, and if your place of employment doesn't encourage diversity, you're gonna really struggle to find workers in the future. All right, so where is the white population going? Largest increase for white people was Mount Vernon Avenue and Long Street in the very neighborhood that is where the Urban League and the King Arts Complex is located. Black middle class with kids is suburbanizing. White folk are moving in. The black middle class that is suburbanizing has children. 
the white higher income people moving inward do not have children. So the racial demographics are shifting in these urban neighborhoods, but the school districts are not shifting in urban Columbus. They're still predominantly children of color and predominantly low income, even though the neighborhood now has higher income residents. Here is a map in red, shows where Asians are not living in Franklin County. In green is where the Asian population is living. We have the largest Asian population in the state of Ohio. It's growing at the fastest rate, and it is the most diverse Asian population anywhere in the state. The Asian community at Ohio State is not the same Asian community that Dublin has, and that's not the same Asian community that's on Morse Road in Dublin. Many of us from majority culture will look at non-majority groups and think, oh, the Asian community is all one community. It is not. It is very, very diverse. And by the way, Reynoldsburg has the what is believed to be the only known Nepali Bhutanese elected to public office in the United States, where Reynoldsburg has a Nepali Bhutanese city council member. In green is where the Hispanic population is growing, and you can see that the Hispanic population is now growing throughout the uh, entire community. I'm gonna pick this up. Uh, okay, let me do this. We've been underbuilding for a long time. This is something that people are now more fully understanding, that we're not building nearly enough housing. 2020 was the most amount of construction we've had in 15 years, and it was not nearly enough to even accommodate growth for that year. We've been stuck at about 9,000 units of production for a decade. We need 14,000 units to match growth every year. So every year, there's 5,000 less units than what we needed for that year. Everybody always says to me, who's going to live in all this construction I see? Well, the reality is we could double the amount of construction that you see. That's the only way we're going to dig out from under this hole. And now with Intel, we have a new factor to be thrown into the mix. Compared to Austin, Nashville, Charlotte, and Raleigh, we are underbuilding compared to our peers. In Raleigh, they added one housing unit for every one job over the last decade. We have added one housing unit for every three jobs over the last decade. That's why the housing market looks the way it does. We now have this scarcity of available units. And here's the current median price point as of August for every community in Central Ohio. In red are the highest third, in dark blue are the lowest third, and in the light blue are those that are running near the Franklin County median. Here's what has happened with price increase in 36 months. Between August of 19 and August of 22, the average price of a home went up by $89,000 in this community. It is unsustainable. I'm gonna wrap this up by giving some images of what's happened in the last 10 years. Here are pictures taken in the exact same spot 10 years apart. Dublin, Bridge Park, 2010, same view in 2020. Henderson Road in Northwest Columbus, two blocks from where I live, just right up the street a mile and a half, Wow. East Long Street heading into the Near East Side, where Italian, oh, short north, no surprise, more are coming. One just got announced two days ago. We see this, right? Our city is reinventing itself, right? That fifth by Northwest Quarter, Fifth Avenue, King Avenue, that's all responding to Wexner Medical Center and all that stuff happening at Carminton, which is the new name for all that land at Lane and Kenny. 20,000 jobs are going there, and they're high-paying jobs. We have this happening in an Italian village, right? In Sharon Woods, in Northland, there's tons of signs where people are fighting Airbnb short-term rentals in Northland. We have people fighting rezonings on Sinclair. People are hiring attorneys to block multifamily housing on Whittier, right? That one just, I was scratching my head the whole time on that one, right? Because the rendering is completely not the right scale. And can we just have an honest conversation when a group of wealthy white homeowners organize to block rental housing? There's a justice component to that too, I have to be very clear, right? A lot of homeowners try to fight rental housing and I don't get it. Intellectually, we got locked in to this very short period of our lives where we need larger expensive homes and we're not 
intellectually open to those other bookends and different lifestyles that actually create lovely neighborhoods, right? And when German villages and Victorian villages are kicking out seniors and kicking out children, they don't become interesting as they once were. In my neighborhood, I have a sign that says, density means diversity, more neighbors is more fun. And I think that people is more important than parking. If a developer wants to build a six, seven, eight story building in my neighborhood and not build one parking space, I say bring it on, right? I think you could find 200 people to live in your building that don't own cars. There's e-scooters, there's buses, there's Uber, there's Lyft, there's all kinds of transportation mobility. People behave very differently. We need to build the city we want to have and not the city that we've had. I think the growth is going to rapidly accelerate in, this re in our region because of Intel, Carmenton, Nationwide Children's OSU. And right now, High Street has been handling the brunt of that growth, right? Where we see these kinds of mid-rises going up everywhere. We are going to have to build a lot more housing. It's going to have to be more dense. It's going to have to be more diverse. And we're going to have to um, just build a very different kind of city, right? Accessory dwelling units, micro units, right? All kinds of things. There's four things I'm going to end with that I think we need to do to have a better region. One is link us. If you don't know that term, that is the inclusive term for CODA's what will be a bond package. It is a $9 billion transportation plan that will irrevocably reshape our urban geography by putting in real bus rapid transit on Maine from downtown to Reynoldsburg, West Broad out to that Hollywood casino, and rebuild the Olentangy Road corridor out toward Dublin, and then reorganize bus routes around that bus rapid transit to dramatically increase connectivity, but it's also about sidewalks and bike lanes, right? The zoning code. Columbus has a new plan called Zone In. Get it? But um bump Not zone out, zone in. Um, our zoning code is 70 years old, and it is bad, and it's all about the car, and it is been rewritten in bits and pieces, but it must be thrown out and started over, and the city has taken that on in a great way, and lots of nonprofits are feeding into that because the zoning code is really not letting our city build the way it needs to build. If you do not live in Columbus, I would encourage you to have your local community look at its zoning code. Is it being racist, right? And is it being anti-housing? And is it being anti-housing for renters? And it probably is. Columbus voters just approved a bond package for $200 million in November. It was only the second time in history Columbus has ever put affordable housing in a bond package. Bond packages, as you know, are streets and sewers and uh, bridges. And the city of Columbus in 2019 made the case that affordable housing is just as important as roads and bridges and sewers. They increased that from 50 million to 200. And if the same leverage holds true, that 200 million approved by voters could initiate a billion dollars in affordable housing construction by leveraging those funds. If you live in Dublin or Arlington or Reynoldsburg, look at your bonds, right? Is the city living into an equity platform on how it invests its dollars? And lastly, how many of you know source of income ordinances? Yes, okay. I love sharing new things. Bexley was the first community in Central Ohio to pass such an ordinance. Up until then, there were only six towns in the whole state that had these ordinances. And what it simply means is no landlord can exclude a, a possible tenant without looking at all legal sources of income. Often, landlords will not include Social Security, disability, veterans benefits, alimony, child support, they will not look at that to verify your income. Your income has to be on a W-2 through earned employment. That is reducing how many people can get access to safe, decent housing. Bexley, in September of 2020, was the first community to say, we're going to immediately move to a housing justice platform by approving a source of income ordinance, which essentially meant the six apartments in Bexley were eligible. <laughs> Thanks, Bexley. But Bexley was the leader. And Columbus, Worthington, Westerville, Whitehall, and Gahanna have now followed, right? So 80% of, 85% of Franklin County is covered. If you live in Arlington, Grandview, Dublin, or Grove City, where you have not passed those ordinances, I hope you would encourage to move people to that housing justice platform. There are things we can do every day. And with that, I thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Hopefully you can stick around if people have questions. We appreciate that and we would love to have you back for part two of your presentation. That was fascinating. Thank you so much. I also have this um, certificate for you, Michael, if you would like to come up. Yeah. We donate to oh. local charities in honor of our speakers every week. So this this week, we're, I'm sorry, this quarter, we're going to donate to Freedom a la carte. Oh, lovely. Great. What thank a great you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.